So for those uh, who don't know me, uh, I'll introduce myself. It's uh, my great uh, privilege to, along with uh, John, uh, be able to work in uh, directing the Quattrone Center. So my name is Paul Heaton. I'm on the faculty here and the academic director of the Quattrone Center. Uh, I'm uh, appreciative of all the work uh, of our staff and certainly the fellows. I think we've uh, heard and talked about some very interesting topics and we have more including, you know, hopefully you've got uh, food for the body, but also we'll give you some good food for thought in this next session. And I guess the way I'd like to preface our conversation is by saying, let's imagine that I were to say to you that we have some sort of new approach or new uh, technology that we could introduce in the criminal justice system. And this is something that would allow us to reduce incarceration on the order of uh, 25%, so uh, reduce people locked up behind bars, one in four. Uh, and you know, for those of you uh, who might be kind of more law and order types, you might say, well, that okay, maybe that sounds good, but shouldn't we worry about public safety? And what if I told you that this new technology we could introduce could achieve that reduction uh, but at no cost of public safety. So in fact, we'd be just as safe after that large decarceration as we were before. And what if I also told you that it's an approach that we could introduce without necessarily needing to spend huge amounts of money. In fact, we could probably save quite a bit of money just on the incarceration of those individuals, never mind the human cost associated uh, with putting so many people behind bars. So I think that if we had that technology, that's something that might seem appealing to a lot of folks. For folks who are concerned about the problem of mass incarceration, uh, that sounds like a nice uh, way to try and address that. And certainly there are many who are particularly troubled by uh, the way that low-income individuals, people of color, get disproportionately caught up in the criminal justice system. I think it's something uh, for uh, conservatives, people who are concerned about the scope of government and our fiscal situation, might be able to get behind. Well, uh, we've actually done some research at the Quattrone Center that suggests there may, in fact, be such a technology out there in the world. Uh, we've done some work uh, studying uh, the Bronx Defenders, a pioneering holistic uh, indigent defense organization. And so what we're going to talk about today is that model. Uh, so the vast majority of criminal defendants, as is, is most of you know, don't have the money to hire their own attorneys. We think about what Howard said, you know, we don't have the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars that it might cost. And so we're reliant upon uh, court-appointed attorneys and public defenders. Uh, so indigent defense, how we're going to staff and organize that, has huge implications for how the system functions. So if you think about the theme that we have, it's about making fundamental changes. And so we're going to talk about some important changes that we could uh, make to indigent defense to allow it to work better uh, and uh, work better in a way that uh, can uh, both uh, support the needs of the individuals who are involved in the system, but also uh, support our shared collective goal of having a system which is accurate and also protects our public safety. So I'm very, uh, I feel very privileged to have, uh, to talk about this model and some of its uh, potential, uh, a distinguished uh, group of panelists here uh, with me today. Uh, to my immediate right, uh, we have Dean Beer. Dean is the chief defender in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. We'll hear a little bit more about Montgomery County, but for those of you who are from out of town, it's a county which is adjacent here to the city. It uh, has a population of a bit over 800,000, so Dean oversees an office of about uh, 40 or so attorneys and then 60 other support personnel. Uh, and it operates in uh, over 40 individual localities. 
Uh, next uh, to Dean, we have uh, Emily Galvin. Emily uh, is a public defender herself. Uh, she's worked uh, and works at the Bronx Defenders, but also is the CEO of an innovative uh, new startup called Partners for Justice, uh, which is dedicated to uh, providing uh, some of the uh, ancillary services associated with the holistic defense model that we'll talk about today uh, more widely available to public defender organizations throughout the country. And then uh, finally, uh, on my far right, uh, we're uh, very pleased to have uh, Robin Marr, who uh, directs the uh, criminal practice in the Bronx Defenders, uh, one of the earliest and most innovative holistic defense providers. Now, just as a reminder for all of you, uh, we uh, are uh, going to uh, share some thoughts and I'll uh, direct some questions to our panelists. But for this panel, we've reserved a fair bit of time for you to be able to send your questions forward. So as we go along, just as a reminder, you have cards on the tables in front of you. As you uh, listen to the panelists and reflect, if you have particular questions, we invite you to write those down on the cards. Uh, we'll have uh, some of the folks from the Quattron Center roving the aisles, uh, and they'll transmit those questions up, and we'll try to get to as many of those audience uh, questions as possible. Uh, so maybe one way we can start off is, you know, I've just said holistic defense, but haven't really told anyone what is this. So uh, Robin, I wonder if you can just give us a little bit of an intro. Tell us a little bit about the model and the Bronx Defenders, and, and what are we talking about? What is this technology that Paul is describing? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to Paul, and thank you to the Quattron Center for hosting this symposium and for inviting me here today to speak. Um, so holistic defense. Uh, my office, the Bronx Defenders, was founded about 20 years ago now, uh, taking what was at the time a radical new approach to public defense called holistic defense. And the idea behind holistic defense is that basically aggressive legal advocacy is enhanced by the recognition that truly zealous representation um, and that better outcomes require for clients require public defenders to take a broader understanding of both the causes and the consequences of involvement with the criminal justice system. Um, and so part of that is listening to clients and to the community to set the priorities of the representation. Um, and it leads to ultimately better outcomes, whether you take a case to trial or whether you're negotiating a plea bargain with the prosecutor or with a judge. Um, the idea is that clients are not just their criminal case, that a more nuanced understanding of clients and their background, their experiences, their families, their community, um, their hopes, their dreams, their goals, makes us better advocates. Um, so, you know, some of the components of taking a holistic defense approach to public defense uh, include, first of all, having advocates who are trained in interdisciplinary issue spotting and who have an interdisciplinary skill set. Um, this idea that an arrest is not just an arrest, that when somebody is arrested, a variety of other things can happen to them in other aspects of their life, in other aspects of the justice system. And so, taking for example, um, a case involving a marijuana possession charge, a low level misdemeanor marijuana possession charge. If you look at that case purely through the lens of a sort of criminal defense practitioner, you might say, okay, so that's a low-level charge. Maybe the prosecutor or the judge is offering a plea bargain uh, where you plead to the misdemeanor and you pay a $25 fine and your case is done. And taking that narrow view, that might seem like a reasonable or good outcome for that client. Um, but if that client is, for example, a green card holder, a lawful permanent resident, and they are charged with marijuana possession, and they end up taking a marijuana misdemeanor plea with a $25 fine, they can make themselves deportable or inadmissible, meaning um, that immigration, if they get on their radar, could end up deporting them, or if they travel and try to come back into the country, they won't be let back in. Um, we also know that cases involving mar misdemeanor marijuana possession can result in people's exclusion from public housing loss of Section 8 benefits. Uh, we know that even a marijuana possession misdemeanor 
can result in cutting off federal financial aid. Um, and so there's all these really outsized consequences that can stem from what, at first glance, looks like a pretty low-level case. Um, one thing that we do at our office is, in the process of doing intakes and arraignments with clients, is we use a checklist, a physical checklist, where we make sure to ask our clients not just about the circumstances of their arrest and case, but also about other aspects of their lives that could be impacted um, and sort of disproportionately affected by their case. So asking them whether they're in school, asking them about their employment situation, asking them about their housing and their immigration status. That's one component of holistic defense. Another aspect of holistic defense is having access for clients to services um, and advocates who are experts in a variety of other legal systems. And so what that looks like at, at the Bronx Defenders is that we are organized not by different divisions where we have an immigration division over here and the criminal division over there, but we actually have interdisciplinary teams where people who practice in a variety of fora physically sit together. And so you might have um, you know, four or five criminal defense attorneys on a team who sit right next to the social worker who works with the clients as part of that team. Um, you might have an immigration attorney on the team, an investigator, civil advocates who specialize in housing and employment, um, so that when, the, when you spot the potential issue, you have people who know about those other areas of law. Um, another aspect of holistic defense is dynamic interdisciplinary communication with clients. And, and what that means is talking to clients and really listening to them once you've spotted the issues and connected them to sort of the experts in those various disciplines, asking the client, what is the most important thing to you? Right? Is, is the most important thing making sure that we achieve a specific outcome in the criminal case, or is the most important thing uh, to make sure that whatever happens in the criminal case, we preserve your housing, or we make sure that your immigration in this, in this country is not affected, your immigration status is not affected, or that the result of the criminal case doesn't uh, mean that your children are taken away from you by child protective services. And so thinking, um, you know, at the very beginning by asking the client, what is it that you want us pri to prioritize in representing you? Um, and then finally, another aspect of holistic defense is having a sort of robust understanding and connection to the community that you're practicing in and um, taking systemic approaches to problems that you see your clients in the community facing. And so at our office, we have on staff community organizers who do uh, trainings, know your rights trainings uh, with the community, telling people about when they come into contact with the police, when they come into contact with immigration or child protective services, what their rights are. We also do uh, impact litigation at my office. And so we, um, by listening to our clients and by listening to attorneys and advocates, when we hear about sort of repeated issues, um, we try to find uh, ways to attack them through more systemic legal challenges. And so, for example, one issue uh, that we heard over and over for years that our clients and attorneys were dealing with was the fact that people um, could end up coming back and forth to court for years before actually getting a trial in their case. They'd be arrested, and then as a result of underfunding of the court system um, and various other uh, issues with our speedy trial law, people would have to come back and forth for appearances over a course of months or years, even on sort of lower level misdemeanor type cases. And so um, after hearing about this and collecting some data, we actually sued the court system over that underfunding and that um, delay in our clients' access to due process and access to having a trial. Um, we also do policy work. We do legislative advocacy on issues like bail reform. Um, we also use communications and media to try to amplify the voices of our clients to talk about um, their stories and their experiences at the hands of the criminal justice system. Um, and another thing that we've started doing in the last couple of years is we now do annual uh, client satisfaction surveys where we actually ask our clients um, what is important to them in the course of representation. What do they want their attorney and advocates to be doing? Um, and how can we be better advocates for our clients? So those are all aspects 
um, of holistic defense and the approach that the Bronx Defenders takes to, um, to representing our clients. Thanks, Robin. So, so let me just, uh, just to clarify to make sure I understand. So it sounds like as you're describing the model, there's you know, a few components. One seems to be kind of a conceptual idea of you know, what is the job of the defender, as it were. You know? Is it about just focusing on the criminal case and kind of getting the best outcome there, or is it, does it encompass this kind of broader set of uh, considerations? Uh, things around housing, around health, uh, other issues. And then you've also <laughs> mentioned an organizational component. So you have this different mission, but to support that, it sounds like what you're describing is kind of a fairly, you know, you might say non-traditional organization with these teams, with the interdisciplinary structure. It, it, would you say that's a, that's a fair characterization? Definitely, yeah. I mean, the, even the, as I said, the physical setup of the office um, the way that we structure our staffing reflects kind of these values. So Dean, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective here. So one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on the panel is of course, uh, in your role as the chief defender, you've been helping to spearhead an effort in Montgomery County uh, to you know, kind of become more holistic and kind of embrace uh, some of these ideas and principles. And so I'd wonder if you could both talk uh, some about, in your mind, what would, you know, what would be kind of the, the difference between the old traditional approach versus a more holistic approach. And then if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, so the Bronx, it's an urban compact jurisdiction. Our situation in Montgomery County is a little bit different. So, so tell us a little bit about how that plays out in a place like Montgomery County. Well, thank you again for inviting me today. This is a, a great opportunity uh, to, to talk about something that I'm passionate in and our office is passionate in. Um, so we are a traditional uh, county public defender's office. Uh, we have, it was a traditional office. It was set up, uh, you know, the traditional model. We'd work hard, we'd investigate our clients' cases. You know, we, we'd, we'd try those cases, find the best outcome, and when that case was over, uh, we would wish our clients the best of luck and, and, and move on to the next case. We had high caseloads. Uh, years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to come into a program that had already started this. Uh, developing a model, the Bronx Defender, I think, was, was began on that model. Uh, we had a, a model that we're trying to change. And as I say, this was a, a process, not an event. And I would say that, so I was lucky enough, uh, the former public defender in Montgomery County was Keir Bradford Gray. You'll hear from her tomorrow. She started this process, and I was lucky enough to be able to build on that. So when I came on, we started bringing on, one of the first things we brought on were social workers to start changing the way our attorneys look at cases uh, right from the beginning and trying to get social workers involved in their cases uh, right from the moment, see if they have housing needs, uh, drug and alcohol needs, uh, mental health needs, to identify <clears throat> those cases early on. And again, it was, it's, a, it's a process of, of training attorneys. Again, we had many attorneys who, was, who, were, um, who were schooled in the traditional model. And so now I think we're asking attorneys to do more than just try cases. We are asking them to, do, to be social workers in effect, to some extent to think like social workers about the, the, the outcomes of their cases and what our clients need. So we started down that process. Over time, we've also brought in a policy director, which has done a lot of work in the community. And, um, and so working with the students in, in the high schools, going into high schools, and working with uh, investigators about trauma-informed care. And so she has a background in trauma-informed care, and I think so we're looking at teaching those areas in the community before they're even in our court system. Uh, one of the things I think that I agree with uh, the Bronx Affairs is so that my role becomes a community organizer. We don't have really um, dedicated community organizers, but in many ways that's what my role is, is to be out in the community. And if we're going to be holistic defenders, we have you know, ideas of what we believe our clients need. We have expungement clinics. Uh, we use um, social workers. We do uh, community forums. But, but from my perspective, 
we need to be out in the community, I need to be out in the community, talking to community leaders, talking to clients out in their, in their homes, in their communities, at their forums, and getting feedback of what they need. So for instance, in Montgomery County, one of the things that we realized early on was that we weren't really uh, relating to the Hispanic population in Montgomery County. We'd heard some anecdotal uh, information that people didn't want to come into the office. They didn't believe that, that we, we catered to their needs. So we, we set up a program. We had another, uh, an outside group come in and go out into the community and set up meetings and talk to leaders. And then we established a program so that we used other law students to take all our documents. And we have documents that talk about what our office does. And we had all that translated into Spanish. So now we go out to the Hispanic leaders and say, we're here to work with your community. Now we're getting more trust. Uh, uh, different various leaders will bring Hispanic clients into our office to start working on their cases rather than avoiding coming into the system, which again only hinders that. So that's the kind of way we started to implement that system in Montgomery County. We've had support from our commissioners in terms of hiring a policy director, in terms of hiring social workers. But still, many of the programs that we need we have to be creative and look to outside organizations and to, and to law students. And that's kind of the way we've implemented and started that process. It's been a, probably a four-year process, and I think we have a long ways to go, but we can see a game plan and where we see this, this coming out and finding, again, better satisfaction from our clients and, I believe, better outcomes using community partners, which is very important to our office. Great, thanks. So, you know, I. I uh, as, as you spoke, Dean, I guess two things that I drew out is, you know, there's this one component which, uh, and Wabin also mentioned this, the community engagement, making sure that we understand the needs of the community, but then also drawing from outside expertise and drawing in the social workers and getting access, and in some cases kind of bringing those into the office, as I know uh, you've done. And uh, I, I think it's particularly interesting that you mentioned we need to look for you know, kind of out of the box, innovative solutions. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm hoping, Emily, you can tell us a little bit about one way that you've tried to address this particular need that Dean has articulated of, you know, how is it that, you know, we've got these traditional organizations, how is it that we're gonna get access to some of this kind of outside interdisciplinary skills that we seem to need uh, as Wabin has articulated in order to make the uh, model successful. Yeah, so um, I, I started out as a traditional public defender and I had so many clients who needed non-legal things more than they needed any help that I could provide. I had so many clients who were gonna lose their job or their apartment because they were missing a license or they couldn't figure out how to get the rent together or they needed help with a family court issue, a single mom who I'm helping on a misdemeanor case but who does not care about my misdemeanor case because what she cares about is keeping her kids at home. And I got really sick of having to say to my clients, I'm so sorry, I really hope that works out well for you. I will handle your criminal case and that's what I can do. Um, so sick of it, in fact, that I moved away from my beloved, beloved California and I moved to New York City to work at the Bronx Defenders because I wanted to be able to say to my clients, yes, yes, I can help you with this. Yes, there is a person in my office who does exactly that. Yes, we're gonna sort this all out and we're gonna come up with some sort of solution that does what you, my client, want and care about not what I, as a criminal defense lawyer, see as the best solution. So in my time at the Bronx Defenders, um, working with an incredible team of interdisciplinary advocates, I had some really valuable opportunities to sort of try to create bridges between offices who wanted to become holistic and the Bronx Defenders. And one of the things I noticed is that when you look at the team, when you look at the interdisciplinary team working with our clients, there is a piece of that team which is perhaps the most important catalyst to making the whole team work together. And that is not any particular lawyer. We lawyers are all in our particular specializations and we focus on what we know. But the Bronx Defenders also uses non-attorney advocates. Um, generally, uh, younger recent college graduates, although we also have career advocates who are incredible. Um, and that advocate can do this whole world of kind of pre-legal or sub-legal or non-legal services 
that often matter much more to our clients' actual real lives than anything we attorneys wind up doing. So for example, um, when someone gets stopped by the police, perhaps on a DWI or some sort of driving case, their car is often seized. And while that criminal case sort of chugs along, what the client urgently cares about is getting the car back because they need the car to get to work. They need to take their mother to her doctor's appointments. I don't do that, the advocate does that. The advocate stands by that single mom's side when she has child services coming to her house and she wants to figure out what she's supposed to say, what should she not say, you know, where does she put this pile of laundry? Like the simple things that our clients need support with. I say simple, although these are often very much not simple things. In any event, um, this piece of the team is something that I realized was replicable in offices that want to become holistic and that are moving towards holistic work, um, but maybe don't have the funding or the resources to hire their own whole team of advocates or to bring in you know, outside people to train them in holistic advocacy. I realized that if we could create a Teach for America-like program where young people learn to do this kind of work, they learn how to negotiate, how to do oral advocacy, they learn how to resolve conflict and how to deal with people in, in crisis, we could give offices the people that they needed, the manpower and the impact, instead of just hoping for the best with like coaching on how to get funding. So. Partners for Justice is Teach for America meets public defense. Um, it's a program where we, I am very happy to say, as of this morning, have hired our first class of advocates to begin working in two sites, one in California and one just down the road in Wilmington, Delaware. And what our advocates are going to be doing is embedding themselves in the public defender's office, being side by side, as Robin noted, physically present with other disciplines, working with social workers and working with attorneys in these offices that want to move towards more holistic practice. These advocates are going to be taking referrals from attorneys. When those criminal defense attorneys don't want to say to their client, I'm so sorry, I can't help you with this, when they want to say yes, they say, yes, here is this advocate, this brilliant advocate, and this advocate is going to help you resolve your housing situation or find you immigration counsel or get your car back. That advocate then becomes essentially the client's partner in getting them whatever direct service the advocate can provide, benefits applications, um, <coughs> negotiations with an employer to explain why somebody's missing work, help with a record clearance petition, things like that. And then also to bring in outside counsel when, unlike the Bronx Defenders, counsel's not available all under one roof. The advocate can find you a housing lawyer. The advocate can find you an immigration lawyer. The advocate can then navigate with the client this entire wheel of holistic service from within the public defender's office, even though that public defender may not have the funding or the resources to become in-house wholly holistic. We are going to be um, studying the impact of our work as we do it, because I think data is really important. I think data is really important to know whether you're doing a good job and whether you're having a net positive impact on the community you're trying to serve. Um, and I also think that it's not a risky proposition to bank on prevention being more effective than cure. So I'm hoping that by getting these advocates on the ground doing early interventions for public defender clients, for returning community members who have been formerly incarcerated and are now trying to get a foothold in the community once again, for other low-income people in need who might just not be involved with criminal justice but need services, I am betting that by helping people with the things they actually need, we're going to stabilize lives and create better outcomes on the back end. And for the conservatives, I'll say it, save a lot of money. But that's not what's important. What's important is helping people get their lives together. So um, that's the initiative. Um, we're really excited to be training at Bronx Defenders. Bronx Defenders is our training partner. They're going to be making our team amazing and then beginning service in the fall in two different jurisdictions. That, I mean, that sounds really exciting, and I'm hoping that maybe, you know, a year or two years down the road, we can have you back and uh, you can tell us more about uh, how uh, the initiative is working. And I, I really appreciate your reference to, you know, I'm an economist by training, right? So the idea that, hey, we want to get some data to try and look at this and understand what the impacts are, I think is important. One of the things that we're excited about in, the Quattrone Center is we are soon to release uh, an empirical study we've done of the Bronx Defenders, which uh, suggests that uh, indeed there uh, are pretty, uh, pretty 
uh, remarkable uh, improvements in outcomes uh, that we can get uh, from this model. Uh, so our work, which you know looks at literally hundreds of thousands of criminal defendants in uh, the Bronx and uses you know for the statisticians out there uh, what we would think is a strong uh, quasi experimental type research approach to really measure what is well, you know what is the effect of having uh, holistic representation versus in an otherwise identical case, but we have a more traditional model operating. What would the impacts be? And we find these, you know, kind of large reductions in incarceration. Uh, uh, our estimate suggests that in the Bronx there were, you know, uh, literally hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of jail days saved as a result of this model. And I'm hoping that, you know, Robin or any of you can just help me understand a little bit, like, what is it about this model? I mean, those those you know seem like you know reducing incarceration by twenty percent, twenty five percent. That sounds pretty remarkable. What is it about this model that might actually generate results like that? Uh, you know, what what do you think is going on? So, I think there are a number of things that are going on. I think you know we were not surprised by these findings. It's nice to have the actual data to talk about, but I think the biggest thing is that holistic defense means that you are sort of bringing the full complexity of your client and his or her experience into the courtroom. And so when you spend time getting to know your client or their family, to so getting to know about sort of their community, you're able to advocate um, about them in a sort of individualized and persuasive way. You're able to talk to the prosecutor in a compelling way about your client who is not just a docket number but a person. Um, and, you know, it, it makes you able to, um, you know, talk about your client um, in, a, in a more nuanced way. But it also, when you know what the potential enmeshed penalties or collateral consequences are of a case, you can also bring that into your negotiations. And so what I mean by that is um, you can tell a prosecutor about what the various uh, sort of civil or collateral consequences could be as a result of resolving a case in one way versus another way. You can use that in your negotiations to say, the reason that you should give my client this disposition is because it is a fair disposition and the alternative would result in her deportation, which is a disproportionate um, sort of consequence for the, the criminal case that we're dealing with. And so, um, you know, in our advocacy, in our written advocacy, we do you know, mitigation letters, pre-pleading investigation letters. Uh, we work very closely with the attorneys, work with the social workers, with the civil advocates, and with the immigration lawyers, and we, we sort of co-author a lot of these mitigation pieces so that we can explain to the prosecutors who often are not aware that all of these things are happening to our clients or could happen to our clients as a result of the resolution in the case and explain to them why the fair outcome, why, why the just outcome is um, the thing that we're, we're asking for. Um, so I think that's a big piece um, of how we're able to sort of uh, get better outcomes for our clients through holistic advocacy work. Well, can I, can I add yeah. to that just quickly? Sure. Um, I think there's also a huge piece that comes with no, when you know more about what's going on with the community, you're more able to see patterns of things that are broken within the community. You're able to see patterns of things that are going badly and that are resulting in people being arrested needlessly and repeatedly. Um, Bronx Defenders did a lot of work uh, with the sort of ongoing trespass situation where people were being arrested in public housing simply for being present. Or I can think of another instance in which people were having their licenses wrongly suspended when they had previously been behind on child support but had been paid up for some time, the license was not being reinstated. If you're not paying attention to the collateral consequences, you don't know about these things that are happening in your clients' lives. And when you are paying attention and you do have that capacity, you can see those patterns and take more of an impact perspective to try and remedy the larger problem as opposed to just the individual iterations of it. I want to hear from you, Dean, on this topic, but I, I, there is something that just resonated with me uh, that you know I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight that I thought was interesting 
about these comments is, you know, we think about the criminal justice system as being so adversarial, and it is adversarial, and there are situations like the ones you described where there's some sort of a, you know, scheduling flaw or kind of a systemic problem that, you know, we need lit litigation and an adversarial stance in order to uh, respond to. But, you know, I, I, it appealed to me a lot what you said, uh, Robin, about the notion that, hey, you know, prosecutors have the same problem that we do, that, you know, cases are going through quickly and it's hard to get information about people's situation. And it occurs to me that this seems like a model which, while there can be an adversarial component, it's also one that even with prosecutors and those on the other side, you know, there's some opportunities uh, for engagement and to share information and, and to build bridges. Dean, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, yeah. I'm not at all, not at all. I, I agree with you. I think the more information a lot of times that we can give the prosecutor on, on those situations, we just had a young man who's going to school, marijuana charge, uh, by using, you know, a little more advocacy in the front. We use we also use a model, participatory defense model, which you may have heard about, came out of California. We have two participatory participatory defense hubs in, in uh, Montgomery County. And again, community leaders and families work in those to to help their clients and their own family members advocate for themselves with us. But by using those, they can go out and get information that maybe we can't find. And so we took that information and presented this to the prosecutor about the effect this marijuana conviction would have on this young man's college career. And people can all understand that. We all have children in college, or we, have, we all went to college. And to think that those minor mistakes now will affect that child's life, uh, young man's life going forward, that was information we could give to the prosecutor to find a, a, a good result. So I think that it's important that, that we do provide that information. For us, we need community partners up front to do that because we don't have the numbers of people that other larger organizations have. So we partner with groups like Participatory Defense, and so we have two hubs in Montgomery County. Those are community leaders that go out and really you know, hustle. They'll even go to court with a client. We had a client who was arrested, picked up on an ICE detainer, and, and 10 of the people from the community from that Participatory Defense hub went to the ICE uh, immigration uh, detention hearing and advocated for that client to get bail. Well, again, w our office doesn't have the support to do that, but by partnering with community leaders, they were there in droves to get that young man a bail so that he could continue on with his case. Uh, so I think that that's where it comes important to us is using partnerships uh, in the community to do that upfront work that we don't have the manpower to do. So, you know, you talk some about manpower, and I guess maybe that takes us uh, to a topic which is almost unavoidable when we're talking about indigent defense, which is the issue of resources and resourcing. And, and incidentally, I'll mention, I encourage you in the audience, write your questions down, and uh, I'll, uh, I'm happy to uh, use some of your questions in a moment. But I do want to explain, you know, so resourcing, right? For those who are in this world, we know that there's just very little political will uh, to provide uh, sufficient resources, and that's true of traditional defenders, certainly true of holistic defense. I mean, it was striking to me listening to Howard, right? I suspect that it's literally true that the 25 million that he spent on his single case is probably what, maybe three years worth of the entire expenditures for a county of 800,000 on every single criminal case there is in the whole county, right? So, I mean, this is like, a, or all the ones involving indigent defendants. So it's, I mean, this is a huge resourcing issue. So, you know, first of all, is this a model that is gonna, are we gonna need a lot more resources? Are there things we can do within the constraints? And, and help me think about, you know, how, how the resourcing issue relates to holistic defense. And again, any of you are welcome, or all of you are welcome to comment on that. So I think um, partnerships is a huge component of being able to do holistic defense, given the realities of limited funding for indigent defense providers. Um, and that can be partnerships with organizations like EMILY's, that can be partnerships with um, law schools or schools of social work. We have, every semester, we usually have about a dozen um, social work students who come and they work and they work on mitigation letters, they meet with incarcerated clients, 
um, and they help us do social work advocacy, um, and they get sort of credit for doing the externship, um, but they're also hugely supportive to our on-staff uh, social workers. We use college interns, um, both during the summer and turn time interns, to, to help with community organizing and investigation uh, work, things like getting video surveillance. College students are very good at getting video surveillance in cases. Um, we try to go out and apply for and seek out funding from foundations and from grants. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to find funders uh, who are willing to give money just for the idea of criminal defense work, but often more specialized populations, uh, funders are interested in uh, giving money to, to support. So we have uh, currently right now a foundation that is supporting our education attorney. We have an on-staff education attorney because the funder wanted to uh, specifically help support kids who are involved in the criminal justice system. We also have grants um, specifically for supporting our work with clients who are pregnant. Um, and so sometimes you can find um, outside resources who you know, might not, again, be interested in just criminal justice stuff at large, but uh, you know, are interested in helping a more specific population. Uh, we also do a lot of work with partnerships with law firms and pro bono work. And so uh, law firms in our community will come in. They are hugely supportive to our impact litigation practice. Um, in our cases, they will help fund experts, um, including experts to do psych evaluations. Um, and sometimes law firm folks just give us donations, unrestricted donations. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we try to kind of find support out in the community um, to help kind of uh, bolster our model. Um, I don't think, you know, I think it is true that um, you might not be able to immediately do everything uh, in terms of holistic defense in the way that our office that's been doing this for 20 years has been doing, but you can do something, right? And uh, as Dean was saying, this is, this is a, a process. Um, and so it's a matter of identifying resources um, and sort of bringing, onboarding more holistic resources over time. I can't, I can't I don't think, emphasize enough that, about trying to be out in the community. And I think it's, one thing I, 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 want, I emphasize to people, it's about showing up. So the first time you're out in the community and you're going to different groups and talking with community organizations, they're very, they're, they're nice, they're, you're the public defender, never met you before, and thank you for coming. But the second time you come and the third time you come, by that third time, now they feel that you have buy-in into their organization and they're willing to buy into your organization. And I think where that comes out on the practical end is, so as a county organization, we're not eligible for certain grant funding because it goes to 501c3s. But we can partner with other 501c3s. And so we work that process out with an organization that they came to trust us, we came to trust them. We could apply for 501c3 funding for what we wanted to do was bring in a community uh, organizer uh, type advocate uh, to come into our community and work in, in, in two of our, of our needier communities. So I think those partnerships take time to develop and for them people to trust you. We worked with law schools and I think using more creative approaches to law schools. Uh, we worked with the uh, Temple University on a, the Scheller Center. They're the ones who put together our whole uh, program on uh, on Latino, uh, really what we did was we looked at the barriers. So they prepared a report. They went out and met with people. They had focus groups. And then they show up with a 30-page you know, report with all the things we need to help the Latino community. We don't have the resources to do that. Um, so I find that those partnerships take time, time to, to develop, but they're so important um, and, and almost necessary for my office to move to that next level. I think one of the things that Dean just mentioned, which is the restrictions on county offices. So many public defenders offices are county or state agencies and are therefore really restricted in their ability to seek funding. They were dependent on a board of supervisors or a state legislature in order to give them funding. Um, one of the ways we've tried to address the resource issue is that, one, if you give people people instead of hoping that they can get funding for people, it works out a lot better for the host office. The host office who cannot get funding for a program like Partners for Justice doesn't have to because we have raised that money for our pilot um, independently. However, it's also um, 
important to think about the data piece as a mechanism towards long-term funding because boards of supervisors and state legislatures are very responsive if you can prove that a program is both effective and cost-cutting, essentially. Um, so our hope is that by funding this pilot, we're going to be able to give offices the ability to seek long-term funding to stay holistic, essentially. So uh, I'm going to go to a few of the audience questions. So there are actually two different members of the audience who had substantively the same question. So this must be on a few of your minds. And, and it's a great question, right? So if we think about the system as a whole, we know that there's the public defender organizations, but a substantial fraction of indigent defendants are represented by private appointed attorneys. And in many cases, these are attorneys where uh, you know, don't e they don't necessarily even have the support of investigators or other folks and are reliant upon, you know, special dispensation from the court to get those sort of support services. So uh, for clients of those individuals and those attorneys, you know, is there applicability of the holistic model? Is there anything we can learn? Is there any way to take these principles we're describing and make them, you know, kind of active and useful for that constituency? That, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, our office doesn't have the resources. I think what I do see is that as, as, as uh, the private bar sees what public defender's offices are doing in this area, they take, they take note and, um, and then, then the questions get asked and the, and the, uh, and the information is shared. I don't know if, if they have the resources to do social workers and, and, and that type of work, but I think the, as, as, the, as the county and the office becomes more holistic, everybody thinks more holistically from private bar to judges to prosecutors, and it, it, it infects the whole system in essence. Yeah, I mean, I think it seems that it's a good question. I think, um, you know, access to Resources, but also access to training is, um, is sort of a, a limiting principle. Um, one thing that, that we've seen in, in New York City and in the Bronx is um, some successful connections between our assigned council panel and organizations in the community, like in, in the area of immigration. So there are nonprofits that specialize in understanding the intersection of criminal law and immigration law, and after the Supreme Court's decision in Padilla versus Kentucky, saying that attorneys are required to advise clients about immigration consequences as a result of a criminal case, um, we've seen our assigned counsel attorneys um, kind of create a formal connection with um, nonprofits that, that can help them advise their clients. So it's not, you know, quite the same as having people on staff or in-house, um, but there is a move to sort of making those connections. And it is my hope that, you know, we've seen from our traditional funders, we're funded by both um, the city and the, and the state of New York, uh, when they see the benefits and, you know, at the end of the day, the cost savings of holistic defense um, in our most recent contracts, they've actually given us money for immigration attorneys, for, uh, civil support, and so um, the hope is that if they're willing to do that for the public defender's offices, then they will start to begin to do that for people who are represented by uh, folks from the assigned counsel panel as well. Thanks. Um, just to add, we're hoping to be able to take referrals from outside partners as well. So as long as somebody is not in a position of legal conflict with an existing public defender client, we're hoping that outside counsel, whoever they be, might be able to send their clients to us in order to get you know, either direct services or referrals and networking. So uh, there's another audience question directed particularly to you, uh, Emily. So uh, tell us a little bit more about the students you're recruiting for the program. <laughs> Where are they coming from? What do you envision for the training? And uh, yeah, do you have any expectations as to, OK, so these folks come in, serve as advocates, and then, then where do they go? Uh, what do you want them to do after that? Oh, the past, present, and future question, huh? Um, so uh, our, our advocates have been, uh, we just finished a big recruiting and hiring spree at colleges across the country. Um, we gave 
a special preference to those students who come from the served community, who have a special connection to the community that we, that we are going to, that the host office is located in, or who come from um, a background which informs their work with the low-income community. So um, generally, we're hiring for <laughs> uh, brilliant young people who are emotionally durable and won't take no for an answer. That's generally <laughs> tenacious, stubborn, uh, I won't curse, but pains in the butt. I think that's a good quality. Um, in any event, um, they are uh, going to be trained at Bronx Defenders um, because nobody knows how to do this. Forgive me, but nobody knows how to do the work better, in my opinion, than Bronx Defenders. Um, so we have a partnership with them. Our team is going to be coming to New York for a, an intensive training in the fall before they begin service in the host cities. Now, obviously, we're not expecting the Bronx Defenders to know how to do a property retrieval in Wilmington, Delaware. So they're going to be getting training on the sort of basic principles that they need to know, uh, oral advocacy skills, negotiation skills, de-escalation, you know, that sort of um, the skill set that it takes to work with our clientele, um, how to, you know, not accidentally practice law, you know, what is confidentiality and what is privilege um, in the legal sense, although I'm sure we'll also talk about it in the social justice sense. But once they have that sort of general tool set, we are then going to be doing continuing trainings in the host cities on specific points of law that they need to know. We have partner organizations in both host cities that are going to be bringing our advocates in for trainings on, you know, what, what are the rights of a tenant in Oakland, California. Um, things that are very specific that they need to know to do their work there. And then, of course, we're going to be, uh, we're essentially set up with an ongoing relationship with those partner organizations so that when our advocates inevitably get probably a million questions that they can't answer off the top of their head at the beginning of their work. They have a resource, they have someone they can call, an attorney who's ready to assist them and mentor them and guide them through that. In terms of what they're gonna do next, um, well gosh, I think a lot of them will probably have an interest in the law. I hope that I am engendering a passion for um, public interest work. Um, but I do not think that this is a program that's exclusively for future lawyers. I think that anybody who wants to understand their community and learn how to tell a story in a way that is important, meaningful, and creates change is going to be, you know, benefited by this program. So future community organizers or, uh, you know, great leaders, novelists, um, I don't know, like documentary filmmakers, um, economists, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, but I, I think you know every profession benefits from the ability to learn someone's story and tell it in a way that creates change, and that's what this program will teach. Well, you said you were looking for emotional intelligence, so I don't know if economist is uh, going to be the Emotional right. durability. <laughs> okay. They just okay. have to be durable. Intelligent would be great, but mostly they just have to take a lot of a lot of trauma. So. This is an interesting question from an audience member, and I, I, you know, this may or may not have been intended, but I'll take it. Maybe a little bit of skepticism, right? So, uh, how empathetic are courts really, in terms of listening to descriptions of collateral consequences, clients' lives? You know, my uh, uh, colleague who's now on the Third Circuit, uh, circuit uh, uh, Stephanos Bibis you know, wrote this nice book about the machinery of criminal justice, talking about how our system can so much uh, be almost like a machine where we just process people through in a mechanistic way. Uh, and, uh, you know, so is it real, really realistic to expect uh, these jaded judges and prosecutors who have just dealt with individual after individual with problems to give a fresh look. And in, and in some ways, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but given that the model is about telling the client stories, can, you know, can you tell us some stories to convince us that this can really make a difference when we're in front of that judge who's been on the bench for many years and who's just seen many people come through this uh, process? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the criminal justice system is an inherently racist, oppressive, dehumanizing system. That is a fact. And unfortunately, a lot of the actors in the system are used to that, are used to operating um, in, a, in, a, in a structure that tolerates um, really doing terrible things to people. Um, holistic defense, I think, I, I think, though, that despite that fact, um, that 
telling people's stories, that, that humanizing people in the, in the eyes of our adversaries or in the eyes of the court um, does have power. And, you know, I, I'm thinking of a, of a client of mine who was charged um, essentially with child abuse um, for hitting her son. She was charged initially with a felony assault. Um, and um, by having her sort of meet with the social worker at my office, by hearing more about her background, she was a veteran. Um, she herself um, had a history of uh, being abused as a child. Um, we put together that information. She also, unfortunately, as a result of her arrest, um, was then involved in the family court system, um, but we were able to use the fact of her involvement in the family court system and some of the services that she was being mandated to do in that court system in our plea negotiations in the criminal system. And the fact, ultimately, that uh, we were able to tell a little bit about her, about her background. Um, she didn't have a criminal record going into this case. We were able to move the prosecutor from thinking this was a case where this woman should walk away with a criminal record um, to showing more about her and more about the efforts um, that she was making through the family court case um, to getting a non-criminal disposition uh, at the end of the day. And so, um, you know, cases that at, at first glance look pretty unsympathetic or pretty serious, I think if you can really paint a more full picture of your client, what brought them to that moment, and the way that they're going to get out of that moment and sort of enlist the prosecutor or the judge in um, sort of achieving what is a just outcome and is something that, you know, ultimately will be sort of rehabilitative, um, I think, you know, that can be very persuasive. I also think that right now is actually kind of, um, you know, at least in New York City, a good moment to be talking about um, sort of the, the effects of the criminal justice system to actors like prosecutors and judges because in the media there's a lot of discussion about um, Rikers Island, the brutality of Rikers Island. There's a movement now among sort of elected officials in New York to try to close down um, Rikers Island. There's more conversation around the bail system and the inequities of our cash bail system. And so that's sort of seeping into the conversation. Judges who read the New York Times, they're aware of um, sort of these issues in a way that, you know, that sort of like scrutiny did not exist, um, I think, you know, a few years back. So my hope is that, um, you know, that this sort of popular consciousness is changing a little bit around some of these issues. Yeah, I think just, I think you, you can't look at it as, as a, a winning or losing totally. I think you're going you're gonna to find judges that are receptive to that. And you're going to find you know, one or two judges that are receptive to these arguments. And then you build on those. And as you get success in one, you move on to three or four. And so if I can, if I can change the mind of two, three, four judges, that's a, that's a big deal. That, that's a huge victory for my clients. And you're not going to maybe change the whole system right away, but you're going to change pieces of it. And, and I, I see that doing things more up front in one of the areas we found success in and, and, and uh, support is, is in the, uh, the female population that we have. You know, mo many people forget that most of my female clients have suffered at the hands of physical and, and domestic violence. They're, they're victims of domestic violence. And so in those cases where that's played a role in the, in the crimes that they're charged with, uh, people are receptive to that. And prosecutors and judges are receptive to understanding that piece. And we've had some, some great success in that area, uh, using partnering with other organizations that wouldn't normally be traditional public defender partners, looking at these issues. So I think you can, judges do listen. Uh, and, and again, you, you find on those successes and build uh, to, to find more success. I don't, I think it's I think it's positive personally. Thanks, and I, I appreciate both of those examples. I really like, and again, maybe it's just because we're here at the Quatron Center, which thinks about the systems approach, but an example where we have these two parallel systems, a family court system and a criminal justice system that aren't really coordinated or communicating or taking things into account. 
being able to, you know, through the defense function, provide that opportunity for story sharing and information sharing, you can, you can really imagine how that could make a substantial difference. Dean, I, I want to turn to uh, something, and, and maybe this is relevant for you as well, uh, Emily, right? So I could imagine, uh, you know, uh, a criminal defense attorney, big caseloads, lots of cases to deal with, you know, someone like you coming to them and say, well, hey, you know, you really need to, you know, think about social work and think about housing, or I could imagine, I hope this won't be the case in your pilot sites, Emily, but you can imagine some attorneys saying, gee, you know, I already have 200 cases to deal with. How do I have time to, you know, start addressing these other issues? I mean, isn't, it, you know, aren't you just adding to my burdens here? So how would, you, how would you respond to attorneys who have those types of concerns? Well, and, and again, that's important. We always talk about, you know, we're trying to change the system. We're talking about changing judges' attitudes, changing prosecutors' attitudes. But really, we have to look within our own organizations to change the attorneys' attitudes. And so, you know, you have a lot of great attorneys or great trial lawyers, and that's what they've always envisioned themselves as. And now you've got to kind of turn them into, into also being, you know, again, looking at the, the social work component of that, looking at the outside of that. And I think one of the ways you have to do that is you have to give them some resources and, and, and show them that, that there is success in this model. And, and so that's what we've done by partnering them with our social workers. And so our social workers are in the office and working with them and, and reaching out to them. Um, investigators are reaching out earlier on. We're doing more earlier interviews, and so we're giving them better tools to do their job. And again, it's another, it's another tool that they have uh, by doing more upfront work, more holistic work, then they have more feeling of success when the case is over. Even if they didn't, look, because most cases end in pleas in the end, you know? Most cases don't go to trial. So it's again a finding, letting the attorney have more uh, help so they can have a better outcome for their clients. Because in the end, that's what they all want, whether they're traditional lawyers or more holistic lawyers, they want the best outcome for their client. And showing them that this gets a better outcome for their client gets more people to buy in. And over time, uh, people's attitudes change. It doesn't happen overnight. Again, it, it, it takes time. And some do and some don't. But, but I think over time, more go towards that, that model than, than not. I think I'm, I'm sort of in our pilot program relying a little bit on like the drug dealer model because I've realized as an attorney, attorneys are competitive and they're curious and they really like getting good outcomes for their clients. They like making their clients happy, right? We like taking a client who's desperate and terrified and being, if we can be in some sense heroic in bringing that client what they are looking for. So when you have when you put the onus on the attorney to think about all these other things and deal with all these other collateral consequences, it can seem overwhelming and frightening and like a lot of work. But when you add an extra set of hands and a person whose dedicated work is to handle that sector, you're telling the attorney, yes, I'm asking you to think differently, but I'm not asking you to do more. I'm simply asking you to work with somebody so that you get more information, you become the most informed person about your client in any given room, you get better outcomes, you get essentially to, to do your job in a more powerful way. And I think that's really addictive. I think making your clients happy is addictive. I think that having um, that sense of a fuller and more complex set of information is really addictive. So. I think that part of the reason we're co-locating these advocates with public defenders is that we're hoping that by having that extra set of hands available and that extra voice in the room, we're going to show attorneys that it's not a burden on their shoulders, it's rather a new tool that we're offering. And, and just to piggyback on that, one of the things we did in our office and we did it in Philadelphia was an immigration a collateral consequences unit. And so you found attorneys who were passionate about that and wanted to take that on and build that up. And then, as, as we know in Padilla, it required criminal defense lawyers to understand the criminal consequences of, of those convictions. But rather than trying to make each individual lawyer an expert in immigration, we said, you don't need to know that anymore. We have people who are passionate about that, really concerned, want to spend that extra time to learn that. And we'll make your job easier, because if you refer that case over to this group of lawyers, they'll give you the answer you need. They'll talk to your client about what needs to be done, and even craft um, 
strategies to minimize those consequences. So again, the attorneys then became kind of, thank God, no, it's not something I have to do. There's help for me. And the attorneys who were passionate about it got to take on another role that made their job more interesting and, and, and got them more excited about their job every day. So I think you find those, what we try and do is find people who are passionate about one issue, whether it's uh, you know women in the justice system or immigration or housing, and let them kind of run with that passion. And then that helps the other attorneys and, and takes the burden off of them. And I, I will just add there, I, there are things that offices can do um, to support attorneys and advocates taking a more holistic approach um, and, and thinking about the use of technology and other efficiencies to make it easier to collaborate with other folks on the team. So um, at our office, I mentioned the holistic checklist, which is a physical checklist um, based off of Atul Gawande's uh, checklist manifesto, so the use of checklists in the emergency room context by physicians um, to avoid making mistakes when doing um, medical procedures. So we use we translated that into um, sort of the public defense setting. And when we do our intakes with our client, we go through this checklist. Now the checklist, uh, we fill it out on paper. It gets entered into our case management system by our arraignment clerks. Um, and whatever we mark on the checklist then generates an automatic email to us about a day later reminding us Hey, Robin, Mr. Padilla, you marked Mr. Padilla needs immigration consult. Would you like to make a referral? And there's a link embedded in that email to me that I click on, and it opens a sort of pre-populated form that has all my clients' demographic information already entered. Um, I add a few more pieces of information that are specific to the immigration referral. I pick the immigration attorney who's on my team from a drop-down list, and I hit send. Um, and then they have sort of the access to the case file and the written information that they need to start the referral. Um, and the fact that we sit in proximity to each other makes it that much easier to have sort of an ongoing conversation. So she gets the paper referral, and then the next time we run into each other, we can start talking about that client's case. Um, so that's, those are ways that you can sort of structurally and using technology help make it easier for advocates and attorneys to collaborate in this way. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you mentioning the checklist, uh, you know, for a few reasons. First of all, you know, John introduced our gathering by saying, hey, what are, so, are there things we can do to change the structure of the environment in which we operate uh, in order to improve outcomes? And I think the checklist uh, that the Bronx defenders have, have devised is a great example of one of those, you know, kind of environmental changes. I also think it helps to answer a little bit some of the questions that have been coming about, you know, hey, for the places that aren't holistic or for the private attorneys. I, I can't remember if this is on your website. I know I've seen a copy of the checklist myself, right? But it occurs to me that, you know, this is something that any, you know, private appointed attorney could have the checklist, the tool that's been developed within the context of this holistic mindset, but you know, I, I think it would probably be good for almost any attorney, right, to think through, hey, what are, what are the issues that my client has, you know, are there going to be uh, these issues? So, uh, you know, one way that, you know, some of the benefits of this approach can uh, reach more broadly. So I, I want to go back to this issue, which I think you've all raised in various ways about you know, making the clients happy, client satisfaction, that uh, dimension of things. Uh, I think it's an interesting uh, one. And as you describe the model, Robin, at the beginning, one of the things you pointed out is this is really about, you know, not us thinking that the best outcome is a lack of conviction, but trying to understand, hey, what does the client want uh, out of this situation? Uh, so, first of all, there's someone in the audience who's interested in, you, you had referred Robin to some efforts within the defenders to actually try and track client satisfaction and measure that. So there's someone in the audience interested in that. I'm actually interested in a little bit more conceptual question, which is, you know, it, you know how do we know for sure that what the client wants is the best thing? And you know, I'm thinking of a kind of a well-known uh, empirical study of professors. So I'll look at my own uh, profession, uh, which demonstrated that uh, uh, using kind of a, a clever research design involving uh, 
actually, of all things, calculus professors at the Air Force Academy that shows that basically the, the, the professors who get very high ratings from their students, if you actually go on and look at those students' performance in subsequent classes that require knowledge of calculus, they do worse, right? So the students are actually <laughs> learning calculus less well, but they like the instructors more. So, you know, what, where does, you know, how do we kind of mix what the clients need, but you also have some professional knowledge about, you know, maybe, maybe other considerations that should be at play. So, the question, how, how does the client know what is best? I think the answer to that is, it is their life, and so they are the people who should be defining what they want out of the representation. And I think, you know, it's interesting. I think we, we have this conversation in the context of indigent defense, but if we were thinking about the attorney-client relationship in the private bar, right, if somebody had retained a lawyer to represent them in a criminal case or do anything else, we would not be asking this question because we take it for granted that when you have the means to hire your lawyer, that person is your agent. You get to ask them for things. You get to direct them. And if, you, if they are not prioritizing the things that you want them to prioritize, you can fire them. Right? And so that power dynamic should not be flipped just because people can't afford their own lawyers. And I think that is sort of at the core of client-centered representation, at the core of holistic defense, this idea that you should not have a different, different control over your agent, your representative, just because you're not paying them or because you're poor. So I think that's kind of the, the short answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, it, that's, that is, to me, the job description. That's that you take on when you take on, when you become someone's defender. You are taking on an obligation to zealously defend that person, and that also means taking on that person's priorities and goals. I mean, obviously there's ethical limits on what lawyers can and cannot do, and I'm sort of excluding from the question the, the client who wants you to go out and whack somebody, but when it comes to the client you know, deciding whether they care more about keeping their record as clean as possible or getting their kids home as fast as possible. I mean, this, that's not my life, that's not my decision, and Robin's right, we wouldn't be asking that question of anyone but indigent clients. I, I guess I, I agree with that, with the caveat, I think many times our clients come in and, and, and they say they want X, and I think it's our job to, to put down the pen when we're talking to a client and you spend that extra half an hour just listening to them and really getting an idea of what they want. Because many times a client will say, I want, I want X. And, and after you spend a half an hour with them and really talking about what X means, they realize that that's not the best outcome for their case. It's not the best. And that's where we as advocates, uh, you know, what, what's the old Brendan Sullivan line? We're not, we're not potted plants, you know? And so we have, a, we have a role, whether you're a private lawyer or a public defender, to advocate and to help guide our clients to what is what, is what they want. I think that just takes time. And so uh, that, that, that's the only caveat I have to that, is I, many times they come in wanting X, but really, that's not what they want. And our job is to help them find that and to be part of that. And, and that's where our, our, our value is. So uh, let me go to one more audience question, and then I want to give you uh, uh, some time. And I'll just kind of prompt this, because we'll be having a way. You know, just to close out after we talk about uh, this question, uh, I'd like you to reflect a little bit on, you know, so if you were to think about your organization and holistic defense, you know, five years down the road, what would you like to see? Where, you know, where are we going? Where are we headed? I'd be interested in your reflections. But before we get to that, uh, 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 we've uh, had some engagement with uh, journalists and, you know, one of my affiliated faculty, uh, Regina Austin, has, uh, has a visual advocacy program that thinks about, you know, using media to tell the stories of clients and we've emphasized in our conversation various ways that we want to get uh, these ideas and stories out there. So, Robin, you had talked some about kind of the community organizing, engaging uh, with partners, and I wonder if you could say anything about what role, if any, visual advocacy might play. I don't know, you know, maybe on your end, Emily, have you thought about, you know, 
getting the documentary and you know <laughs> you know having having some films so that we can see this new startup as it grows and kind of chronicle the experiences of uh, of your advocates uh, it seems like that could be uh, a pretty uh, fascinating prospect I, that would be totally fascinating and a real problem for client confidentiality <laughs> but I'll think about it uh -huh. um, I think you know we have, and I mentioned this before a little bit, been able to to work with journalists and some folks in the media. And so, when um, there's a client who understands sort of the waiver of confidentiality and wants to get out there and wants to talk about their case and tell their story, obviously after getting advice from their lawyers about about that, um, we do try to connect clients who are interested in doing that to journalists who want to help tell their stories, um, and. We also do, we actually do have an in-house documentary, um, I forget what the name of it is, something about holistic defense um, through the lens of four different clients' stories. And you know, our office, through a grant from the Department of Justice over the last couple of years, has um, founded the Center for Holistic Defense, which is a, an organization that provides technical assistance to other public defender offices around the country. And one thing that we do at the beginning of a lot of those trainings is show this sort of documentary because showing the actual clients talking about what the experience of working with our office is like is, is much more powerful than us you know, doing a PowerPoint and, and just saying it from our perspective. Um, so we have been able to incorporate that a little bit already. Great. Uh, well, let's get to that final question about where we're going, and I'll, you know, I'll take moderator's privilege and answer my own question first, right? Which, you know, of course, from the uh, perspective of uh, someone who's interested in doing research to create real-world change, I'm very excited about some of the emerging knowledge that we're getting uh, about this model. I'm certainly excited to see what we learn uh, from the uh, wonderful uh, initiative that you're starting. Emily, uh, I, I would love to see five years from now for us to just have a much uh, better knowledge base about how it, precisely this model works. Uh, the work that we've done at the Quattrone Center thus far has focused on criminal justice outcomes, and of course that's a very small slice, right? And if you think about the idea behind the model, it's about impacting people's lives, not only within the system, but in other systems with housing, with their family relationships. So understanding the impacts of the model, uh, those outcomes seems fascinating. I think there's lots of important heretofore not fully researched and understood questions about scalability, about how we make these concepts available to the small public defenders organizations out in you know, the rural parts of Pennsylvania and other places, about how we make these concepts available uh, and more readily accessible to the, you know, the private uh, defense council. So more research and understanding of how, you know, how and why this model works and how we can scale it would be my wish for five years down the line. Well, I'll, uh, I'll uh, go to where I would like to see, you know, again, I think one of the, the, the things you have to think about is every community is different in, 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 in different areas. So Montgomery County is really a, a microcosm of this country. I mean, we've got rural areas, farmland, we've got inner city, we've got um, you know, pockets of great wealth. So, so where I would like to see a public defender's office like mine go, mine would be more social workers, more upfront work, more ability to do more work to find clients employment, to find them education before the case is, is finalized so that we have more, um, so we can be better advocates at the end of that case. So that we can go to a, a judge and say, our client has a job now or is in education rather than this is what's gonna happen afterwards. And so I guess that takes more you know, social work and more people up front in that system to, to be able to front load the, the process as best as possible. That's, so that's where I see somewhere in my organization going. And then again, a, a really vibrant uh, process of, of, of uh, of bail reform, uh, meeting, you know, trying to keep people out of jail up in the front end for cases. As you all read the research on, on bail reform, uh, it's clear we, we can do a better job with that. So that's where I hope to see our office and, and offices like mine going. 
Emily? Um, my hope is that this program is going to transform the way people access the justice system. I think that um, I would like to empower communities to feel that when they have an issue, even if it is a small issue, even if it's something that they, you know, think they might otherwise ignore, to make our program so integrated into the communities we serve that community members know there's someone they can go to, there's help they can get, and that they can have that, that seamless access to a wraparound team of experts if they need it, that it's at their disposal, because I think that amplifies people's voices in the justice system. I think that going to housing court with a housing lawyer by your side is literally a different world than going to housing court by yourself. And I think that what I would like to see is this program expanding to serve more communities and in each of those communities making the people who live there able to have a voice in the system that they would not otherwise be able to have. Additionally, I'd like to you know, create a generation of advocates who've had their lives changed by the work that I hold most dear. So I think that um, the benefit to both the served communities and the advocates is something I would like to see expand and go nationwide. Thanks. Robin? So I guess my dream is holistic defense from sea to shining sea. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is not a proprietary model at all. It's something that I think the more that offices can incorporate into um, their relationships with their clients and their advocacy, um, you know, the more they can figure out how to tailor holistic defense to their jurisdiction, um, the better the representation of their clients is going to be. They're going to save, as we've seen through, um, through the, the research that's already been done, they're going to save their clients days in jail. They're going to preserve people's housing. They're going to pre preserve people's jobs. They're going to keep families together. They're going to keep people in this country. Um, one thing that's already been happening is that um, the leadership of different public defender's offices have sort of started a conversation and sharing ideas more. Um, so at, at conferences and at trainings, um, there's now sort of um, more of a dialogue about the different things that, that offices around the country are doing. And part of uh, my hope is that you know, holistic defense will be um, sort of represented at those trainings and conferences so that more offices and advocates and attorneys have exposure to these ideas. Well, uh, please join me in uh, thanking our wonderful panelists. So if there are any audience members who have additional questions for the panel, I'll commit you to staying down here for a little bit longer. And uh, we're moving now into a short uh, networking break. Uh, so that's going to extend until uh, 1.45 when we'll reconvene uh, for a session on uh, criminal uh, histories.